This is People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm Kurt Karstensen. This is episode 28 of the podcast, and my guest today is Anu Chudasima. Anu is one of my friends that best demonstrates a love for space, astronomy, and the unknowns of the universe. As you'll hear in the conversation, our shared desire to understand space is what led to our current friendship. Anu has lived in different parts of the world and will explain why it could feel like she didn't have a place to call home at certain points in her life. And in the personal growth segment, we talk about our Toastmasters experiences. Plus, Anu opens up about her recent battle with cancer. In the Being Wrong segment, Anu will explain how she was wrong about making decisions too quickly. Plus, a bonus topic of a reason why there hasn't been a woman as U.S. president, at least as Anu sees it. Now, let's get into my conversation with Anu Chudasima. As we begin this episode of People I Know Show, I'm here with a friend of mine who I just realized I can't even pronounce her name properly. Pronounce her name for me, Anu. It's Anu Chadasima, and actually my first name is Anu Radha, but I just go by Anu because it's much easier. It is much easier, and I'm sure I've heard this before, but where does your name derive from? It's Indian, and people say it wrong all the time. People usually say Anu, which is I accept, it's fine, because I, I accept it more than other variations of it. People have called me Anu, I hate that. Uh, people call me Anu when I grew up in Barring that went to British school and they would say the British kids would say Anu. I didn't like it. The Arabic kids or Arab kids would say Anu. I hated that. Um, then when I went to Canada, they would say Anu. And you know what? That one wasn't so bad. So I was like, okay, I can do Anu. <laughs> and so now I'm Anu. When you get one that you don't accept, do you call people out on it? No, not at all. I just let it go. The only people I call out are people that I am or in the past, that I would have dated. So I would expect people that I'm dating to say my name properly. Uh, and then also, obviously, you know, my close friends, but I've never had to call them out on it because they're Indian, so they know how to say it. Uh, but really, it's just, for example, now my husband, Jason, he actually says Anu. And there was a point in our relationship when we were dating, I'd keep harping him on it. And I'd say, Jason, it's Anu. It's Anu. It's Anu. He's like, I can't say it. I can't say it. And then eventually one day, he just got it, like, and it was... It's snap of a finger, it just suddenly came. And ever since then, he's been able to say it. And actually, his parents try too, because they, you know, they're, they're very nice people and they want to say it right as well. And they, they're pretty close and they get it right. I'd say mom gets it right 80% of the time, uh, dad, maybe 10%, <laughs> but they try, which is nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm afraid to even say it again because yeah. I, I feel like I'm going to be wrong. Anu. Anu. Yeah, there you go. Who said it? And I say your last name one more time. Chudasama. Chudasama. Yeah. I was going to, I thought it was something totally different. Chudasama. That's not that difficult. That's what everybody well, says. It, if I, but if I don't think about it again for a week or a month or a year, there's no chance I remember, I think. That's the problem. People always look at it or once they hear me say it, they'll say, oh, just how it looks. But they don't try, you know, beforehand. They'll always just ask me, oh, how do you pronounce it? Even in court, if I'm in court, nobody wants to pronounce my name. They're like, oh, um, and would you please you know, say your name? And I'm like, okay, sure. Just like me two minutes ago. Great. Yeah. Well, you've, you've touched on a variety of things that I think we can get into <clears throat> in this conversation. And let's see, why are we, where should we begin? I th okay, how about this? How we know each other, and you mentioned people you dated. We went on like two dates some years ago, if you yeah, can even recall. Yeah, it was... This. Several years ago, and I think it was, was it OK Cupid? OK Cupid brought like, us together. And I don't even remember where we went, but I remember we hung out twice, and that was it. That was and it. then there were years in between, and in those, and I think it was, this was years ago, right? This is like when I first moved to Minnesota, maybe? I'm going to say five years ago. Yeah, maybe five, met. six, something like that. Okay, five or six years ago, we met. And then as I used to do, now I do it less when I, maybe when I went on a date with someone or everyone, everyone that I knew, I added to Facebook. I probably added you. Maybe you added me, but I probably added you. You added me, I remember. <laughs> and then we didn't really talk for years, probably two or three years. And you, we stayed as Facebook friends that weren't talking, which, you know, happens. Which is like most people, right? I, for some reason, I've, I think, I don't even know, between 1,000, 1,500 friends and I the people I actually talk to in my real life, you know, it's it's so much, so much less than that. But 
You had a birthday. I think that's common, but something I've done occasionally, and it would have been my birthday just over two years ago, I made an effort at that time to invite everybody, all the people that I really want to have at this birthday gathering, and all the people like you at that time that I knew, it's, I thought might still live in the area and might come out thinking that maybe a couple people will show up. Yep. Well, you are one of those types of people that showed up and I don't know if it was more because me for my birthday or what I was doing. Well, the, the space thing was definitely really cool because, so you were having it at Como Planetarium or, yes. you know, at the time it was at Small was it Como? Yeah, it's or was Como it? Elementary School yeah. Planetarium in St. Paul. And I love anything to do with space and astrophysics and just the universe and all that stuff. And back at that time, I, I mean, I was living and breathing at any moment I could in my car. I still do to some extent, but now I've expanded to some other um, audiobooks that I've been listening to recently. But at that time, it was every day Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, in my car. I stopped listening to the radio years ago because of uh, my interest in space. And so it was two things. One is I'm always up for doing things. I'm always up for connecting with people and I really enjoy it. I love socializing and I always remember you being a very nice person and a nice guy. And I was like, well, why not? And I I think Jason was out of town that time, which also helped in the sense that I, you know, when you're, when you're in a relationship, you kind of make decisions of what to do together. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our Saturday. What are we doing with it? This is our Thursday or whatever it is. And I can't remember if that time Jason was here or not because you might have been on a weekday, actually. It was like a Tuesday or Wednesday. You know what? He was here. He was in town. But because it was a weekday, he didn't come out. And so then I was like, well, I'm going to just do it because I want to go and meet up with my old friend and I want to go and go to the planetarium. And so that was awesome. It was Tuesday because that's when I think Como does their, you know, their little show. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. And then we went, you had it at a brewery or a bar Yeah, there first. was a bar beforehand for people to meet up. Yeah. That's that's where you showed up to. And then we went to the planetarium and saw the show. And then I think you stayed over, stayed out for the next bar afterwards. Yep. We went to some bar. I can't remember the name, but it was fun. Uh, it was the, like a dive bar of yep. some sorts, right? And then and that was the last time I saw... Then after that, the next time I saw you was another science thing, right? We went to the mag, the Museum of Electricity and Magnetism. That was one of the next two times. It was the Bakken Museum. Yep. And they have, yeah, science-related... I think they had a specific show or specific, specific stuff that night, but also... Like an alcohol martini night with some... Yes. You could walk around the museum as adults and kind of play around with stuff. Yep. So that was one of the times. And we also, I think you went to the state fair, you met up or I saw you. That was around the same time, I think. In between, before the museum, we went to the state fair because that was that summer. I think Jason had gone somewhere on a bachelor party and maybe even his own. And I'd really want to go to the state fair. And I, and so I think you said you were going and I'm like, Hey, I'd love to go. And so we went and you were doing that 5k or something. Yep. And your whole family, I met them, and they're they're wonderful. And I was I was yeah. going through before I I arrived here today to talk with you. I was thinking, how many times in my life have I actually seen you? And I I put it at about this is probably about number ten, which if based that, on yeah. no, I, I think I did come yeah. up with ten, but was it okay? I don't know if we need to go through every single one right, of here no. and have a timeline, the big chart, and uh, I and, need the proof. I need the data. <laughs> I, I can figure it out and 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 explain afterwards. But I, I think the point of of that is we must have that in common where yeah. we're not afraid to connect or reconnect even when I just imagine some people, the idea of, of purposely putting yourself in a situation to hang out with someone you went on two dates with some years ago and you know never really amounted to anything. I think most people just never want to do that. Maybe I'm generalizing, but I I think we are somewhat unique in that way that brings us together and allows us to be friends at this point in our life. Yeah, I would say that. And I've never looked at even people I've dated as any differently than just meeting people. You know, it's to me, it's always a potential friend. Yes. They don't always, you know, end up like that because most people don't have that same viewpoint. And so a lot of times you date, you know, you go on a date or two and you just never see the person again. That's fine. Uh, but for me, I really enjoyed making friendships with people, even, you know, exes and stuff. I still am friends with them. There's nobody that I'm like, oh, I hate that, you know, a-hole or whatever, you know, even if they 
didn't do nice things to me or whatever it is. I just, I don't keep that ill will, which is probably good for the mind anyway in the long run. Let's get into more about your curiosity about, about space. That was one of the two things that I, I guess leads to us being here today is that if I was going to some other thing that you weren't interested in, maybe you went to show it up and we would have not reconnected and you know, life goes on. But that's, I guess, the only way it ever could have happened because I wanted to go to the planetarium and you wanted to see what they were doing there. Mm-hmm. And you, you said you listened to you know, Star Talk and whatever else yeah. all the time. Like, what, what are you learning? What fascinates you so much about space? So I don't know if I can necessarily tell you what I'm learning because my brain doesn't retain things. in Because I with my work, I'm a lawyer, you know, a personal injury lawyer. I have to keep so many things in my head as it is. So when I listen to podcasts... It's so fascinating at that moment, but I can't recite necessarily, you know, 10 facts to you. What I can tell you what fascinates me is, you know, black holes. I love the whole, you know, you're going in spaghettification and all the things that, you know, the scientists talk about where, I don't know, I've heard this thing where I think it was Hawking radiation, you know, those kinds of things where something goes in and then it doesn't, nothing can come out. But have you heard about this? I think so, yes. Yeah, but there is something that, leaves that kind of will tell you what went in in the first place. And there's one thing I listen to. I've also heard people say, oh, once something goes in, nothing comes out and you can never tell what went in. So there's just what I like a lot about science is there's just so many different theories and they test them. And I listened to some, it was like on TV the other day, one of the space shows, and they were like, oh, well, we'll never know if black holes are real or not. You know, it's just not. But then recently we had, you know, where they have a picture of one now. Yes. And how cool was that? I mean, it was just to me, like looking at that picture, it's so incredible. My favorite picture is the the picture that you get from the Hubble Deep Space Probe, you know, where they, you know, what I'm talking about where you see like the hundreds and billions of galaxies. And, and that moment in time when scientists must have looked at that and been like, you know, Holy! You're allowed to crap. swear in my podcast. Okay, yeah. holy shit! Uh, when you initially think maybe our solar system is kind of it, not necessarily like these scientists, but you know, in time, every time scientists have made discoveries, we've progressed. It went from being, you know, we revolve, or the whole solar system revolves around us, to now we revolve around the sun, and now it's just a solar system, and now Pluto's not a planet because it doesn't belong in this classification of uh, planetary bodies with us because it's got its own, you know, buddies hanging out there in the Kuiper belt. And then you look beyond that and there's just, you know, in the Milky Way, there's 200 to 400 billion stars and about 100 billion planets. That by itself is mind blowing. You can't even comprehend it. You can't comprehend it. And then you think about in the whole universe, observable universe, not what we know outside of what we can observe. There's hundreds of billions of of uh, galaxies. galaxies and in those galaxies are you know probably just as many stars and and planets and so that's just such a mind-boggling concept and for me the biggest mind-boggling i would say is where did we you know how did this big bang come about how does something come from nothing how does something so large and vast come from you know something so minuscule that your naked eye can't see it even you know you know what i'm talking about it's just so small that well, here here's my story of when this first became interesting to me. I think it was my first planetarium show about ten years ago. Where the things that you're talking about now, I think I was kind of aware of, like the, the numbers, the numbers that you can't comprehend. The first time I began to possibly comprehend it is seeing a planetarium show and just recognizing, like visually, how many galaxies there are and how big they are. That was the the first time that connection was made in my brain was like we are so insignificant and you know whatever that means i guess we are significant in our own little world our own little existence but in the grand scheme of what exists to think that we're important and more important than everything else and to think that we know anything (laughs) when there's so much that we don't know yet and may never be known it 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 was really it was one of the first things that made me more confident as as i mentioned in a few episodes of the podcast previously that i identify as an atheist now because for the first time there was something way bigger than whatever any religion could ever even try to explain at least in my opinion and just seeing the world in a different way the universe 
in, in that way, it's like, wow, I, we need to learn so much more before we think that we have these answers. Oh, sure. Speaking of uh, atheists, so, you know, I'm not religious and I don't know where I dropped off. It wasn't necessarily because of space for me. It was That was not my revelation. Yeah, that was one of the many things for me. For me, it was years ago. And I remember being, I was interning at the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. And uh, for actually now, he's going to be Justice uh, Brian Hagedorn. He was a law clerk at the time for the justice I was interning for, Justice Michael Gableman. These are the Supreme Court justices. You of know, the, the, the state of the Wisconsin. The top of the, yeah, state okay. of the head court of the state of Wisconsin. And uh, now, I guess he's now judge to be justice, uh, Brian Hagedorn, he asked me, he's like, so what do you believe? Do you believe in God? Because we had some religious case that they were writing an opinion on. And I said, you know, I really don't know. I said, maybe there's something out there. This is, I've evolved from then. But at that point, when I say evolved, I don't mean I've gotten better. It's just my thoughts have changed. Yes, of course. You've had more thoughts. I've had more thoughts. Fewer I don't thoughts. Be, I'm not using evolve to say better or worse, just they've changed. At the time, I was like, well, maybe there's something but I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. There's nothing that I concretely can say that's what is my belief. It, maybe it was more floating around in that, what are my beliefs? And then just as time went on, I've just really come away from it. I have, to me, I've got issues with religion sometimes. I mean, I don't care what people believe. If they want to believe, that's fine. What bothers me is when religion divides so many people. You know, when people are doing these horrible things like bombings, you know, the ones in Sri Lanka where they're killing people because of their religion. Mm -hmm. And that that's when I really get bothered by it. It's like, why can't we, if you want to believe, go ahead, but why can't we peacefully coexist? You know, but that's a little tangent. So what I was, when I, that's where I was saying for the atheist part, but as far as a, a really cool thought or thing I learned in space, you were asking me was, uh, have you seen that chart, the sort of like January through December of our universe? Yes. And it's I, so my, you know, when you look I at it. I saw it for the first time on, uh, let's see, Neil deGrasse Tyson did the reboot of the Carl Sagan. Oh, the Cosmos. Cosmos. That's the first time I saw that. Well, I did a Toastmasters speech. Speaking of Toastmasters, we're both, <laughs> we're both Toastmasters, uh, you know, we're in it and we have different clubs, but I gave a speech about it and it was called Lucky You. And in my speech, I was kind of tied, kind of started out with, you know, people are always they're thinking, oh, I wish I could just win the lottery someday. My point is you already did by just by being here because the chances of any one person being born or already, you know, like one in a quadrillion, if you want to be, you know, really liberal with that number or even let's say one in a quarter, whatever. I don't, I don't have numbers, but it's, it's really special. And the thing about it is, you know, when you look at kind of the evolution of even people, you'd have to have 100,000 generations of people to just come to you, to have you be the person that's born. And even in the scope of our, our birth and our planet, we wouldn't be here. Human beings wouldn't be here if certain events hadn't happened, right? If uh, in, like that 10 kilometer asteroid hadn't come and struck our planet and then the dinosaurs all died because had the dinosaurs not died, then who knows if the little mammals would have had a chance to actually come up from, a, you know, underground yeah. and then evolve into not what we are now, you know, because from what I've read and learned, it's, it's because the dinosaurs were dead and all the other little mammals were able to come up. And then that took, you know, obviously a very long time, but eventually led to us. And so just those kinds of things, like what if that one asteroid hadn't come and hit us? You know, how lucky are we to be here to even ask the question of, you know, how did this all begin? And if it wouldn't have happened that way, we couldn't even ask the question. So then we couldn't calculate it. And then, yeah. Right. I mean, it's just so to me, spaces and everything about it is just so mind boggling. Even just the distances between us, uh, you know, even our sun, that's so far away. The sun is what, 99.86% mass of our whole solar system. And if you've looked at those other images, the sun's like a baby compared to yeah, some I, other stars. Our sun is small. Yeah, it's a small sun. So it when you look at those like sizes and the distances involved and the, you know, a light year, a light year makes it sound so small, but that's the time it takes light to travel one year, which is actually crazy because light is the fastest thing we know of. And then you, you're talking in hundreds of billions of light years away. That's the scope of our universe. To me, it's like, you know, <laughs> like your mind is just I can bursting. see why, in addition to all the other things you have to remember when you're learning about this, that you, it, a lot of it just kind of comes in and out, but you enjoy just hearing it and, and oh, knowing yeah. what's going on. There's so much to comprehend and learn. Absolutely. I listen to things on repeat a lot. So 
there's this book called Astro, uh, not Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. I did listen to that two or three times, but it was a, it was a Neil deGrasse Tyson book where he was a co-author along with J. Richard Gott and another one. Um, what was it called? Uh, it's some lengthy, lengthy astrophysics book, which I can only imagine is a textbook for people. And it was about 18 hours long. And I've listened to that book four times because <laughs> I, it's when, always when and where do you find the, the car. time to have that add up? So my office, um, I work at Harper and Peterson, we're a personal injury law firm. It's all the way in Woodbury. And for me, that's a long time to sit in the car, especially on the way home because traffic's always worse going home. Mm-hmm. So I just, I don't listen to the radio. Radio drives me nuts. I can't stand the song on the radio. I can't, you know, it's just so much of the same stuff. And so I really enjoy listening to these podcasts and that's where I listen to it. But it's called Welcome to the Universe. And it is, let's see, Neil deGrasse Tyson, J. Richard Gott, and some Michael. Welcome oh, sorry. That was me trying to play it. <laughs> well, my, the Michael guy, his name is uh, crossed out, so I can't tell you. But <laughs> it's a Michael. Michael S. There you go. But And what's, what are you learning in that, that or not learning in that that you feel like you want to listen to it four times? So the reason I listen to four times, it's so dense. I mean, this is a book for people that have probably astrophysics degrees or studying to be an astrophysicist. They, it's all math, science. I mean, I'm learning stuff in this book or I have learned in this book that I don't even hear in podcasts or on YouTube videos or any lectures that Neil deGrasse Tyson has given because it's so dense that it's not something you usually go on stage and talk about. You know, you know, mm-hmm. talk about it's, it's, it's much, it's kind of like, science squared it's just a whole level above and so for me i like listening to it just because i feel like i'm learning things that i never did and i never did physics in high school i i went to one day of physics class and because it was a time when i decided i, I was like oh you know what I'll, i talked to my career counselor and i thought okay well she said dentistry is good so okay i guess i'll do that i don't really like hospitals so maybe i don't want to be a doctor so I went to one day of physics class and my teacher who I had in my grade 10 or 9 science class, I, he was not a good teacher. Uh, but he really ruined science for me. I, I hate to say that about a teacher, but he did. And, I had, and where was this? Where in the this world is, was this? This is in Arendelle Secondary School in Mississauga, Ontario, okay. So, which is where I went. Uh, I moved to Canada when I was 12 from Bahrain. I was born in Bahrain, and, but my background's Indi- from India. So we moved there. My family, we immigrated there then. From 12 till 23, I was in Mississauga slash Toronto because I'm, Mississauga is like 15 minutes from downtown Toronto. So it's like okay. kind of here if we're thinking about Roseville, you know, it's like it's essentially a suburb of Toronto. Yeah, okay. like it's a suburb. And then I was in down, I was actually in Toronto proper. But um, then I went to law school in Madison when I was 23. From then there, I moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Then from Eau Claire, I came to Minneapolis. So now you've got my, my routes that I've taken. Mm-hmm. But so I took the science class and it was just so, he made it so boring, so terrible. I just said, nope, I'm changing. So that was the day I went to, I switched all my clips. Cause you know, in the first week or something of classes, you can switch without losing any kind of yes, credit. You got to be quick about it though. Yeah, really quick. So I switched suddenly from all these science classes to accounting, to law, to just these economics, the whole opposite essentially. And that, I think that day, that decision to change has really driven the course of the rest of my life because had I stayed in science, I you know would have likely done something science-based. So if this particular teacher wasn't, you didn't find him to be so boring, you might have found the, a different teacher to be fascinating and would have gone that direction. I you think I it's mean, as I've, simple as that? I think it's as simple as that. I think it could have happened. Um, I still don't like hospitals. I don't know if I necessarily would want to be a doctor unless it was private practice or something where it's an environment that I enjoy. But maybe I would have, I think I could have discovered a love for science had I had the right teacher, right environment. Because I never even, le- I never learned any of this stuff until just some years ago when I started listening to it. I didn't care much for science at all until just a few years ago. I'm 36 now and maybe in the last seven or eight years, it finally was something I became interested in. Before that, I just, I didn't care at all. So maybe it's the right influence or maybe I just wasn't ready for some reason. Hence your recent birthday at another planetarium. Yeah, that's, that's the most <laughs> recent time I saw you got a, another gathering at uh, a different planetarium this time around. It was bigger. And I thought the show was really nice and showing people that are new to science, like to new to at least space, the vastness of it. 
you know, especially those kids. Yes. There were a lot of kids. They were very loud. <laughs> but, but it was fun. Yeah, I, I don't know if I learned as much from that one. I didn't learn anything in that <laughs> sense, but I just think it was nice. It's always nice to listen to. For me, it's just something, even if I'm not learning, for example, Neil deGrasse Tyson, love him. But every, I think 10 times I'll listen to him, he repeats things in about eight of them. Like I'll hear the same fact from him over and over and over and over again. Sometimes it gets a little tiring. For example, he's got that, um, you know, the colors of the rainbow thing. He loves Isaac Newton. That's his favorite guy. So he'll always have to say why indigo is added. It's not an actual color that's separate, but Isaac Newton had a fascination with the number seven. So he added indigo to the spectrum. Did you know I think that? I've heard that yeah. from him, but probably not nearly as many times as you've heard it from yeah, him. I actually saw him, uh, Jason, for my birthday. He took me to Neil, see Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, that was like one of the best things ever. Like it was just one of the best birthday presents. I just about shit my pants. <laughs> like, it was just so, I, I wanted to scream out from the theater like, I love you, Neil. But I didn't. I held it together, but it was it was crazy. I, I think I, it was like seeing a celebrity for me that I'm just in, in awe of, you know. He, is he the, the rare celebrity that you would have that Yeah, and reaction? actually, so... Jason and I sometimes play a game where we have where, you know, you say, who would you like to have dinner with, you know, X or Y. And so we, he picks like, my two favorite people that I would like to see. And it was Barack Obama and Neil deGrasse Tyson. And at the time he asked me, I was just so into Neil. I mean, I was this is like probably my fourth time listening to that book. And even though the the the, the guy who's narrating just has the worst voice in the world. <laughs> I mean, it's like. It's so bad. And that actually has ruined many audiobooks, including probably that one to some extent for me. Because you need somebody who can actually, you know. There must not be enough of these voiceover guys that. You, I don't think them, so. Yeah, some aren't near. Some are really good. And some are like. Eh, I am yet to. Else I've, the it. only good one I heard was recently. I was listening to an audiobook about this. It's the, It was called The Obesity Code. I was just. I'm trying to be a little more healthful. And so I was listening to this guy and it's. It was a doctor, like a doctor had written this book. He's not the one that narrated it, but that guy actually sounds interesting. Sounds like a real person. But some of these people, I mean, just terrible. Like, well, today in astrophysics, we have a discovery. <laughs> I mean, it was just so, so bad. Maybe you should apply for that gig and, and, and show these people how to do it. Are you kidding? I have a terrible voice. <laughs> like, I, I hate the sound of my voice, especially when I hear it on a pod, like on a, if I hear it in a recording. I, I listened to one of your podcasts and you're the principal of your school. Yes. Well, he was a teacher back then, yep. then. And he was saying the same thing, how he hates his voice. And I was like, I relate to that. I think a lot of people do. I used to as well, but I worked in radio years ago and I, I got over it pretty quickly. And then now I don't. You were in radio? I didn't know that. Yes. Many, many, many Actually, years I ago. I think I did. My but brother was a, he wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And because I was little brother, six years younger, I tagged along and eventually kind of took over for him in my hometown calling the games. Like they hired me to do it as an 18 year old or 17 year old senior in high school to call the games on the radio. And there's no way that I was qualified, but somehow that happened. And then I, I got better over time and I just, I was around it for a long time and went away from all of that for almost a decade and then this little podcast idea came to my mind and I put it together. So it's the first time using those skills, if you want to call it that, in many years. But I did do that a lot back in the day. I want to get back to your podcast thing, but I'm going to just finish my Barack Obama yes. deal thing. Let's so hear about it. At the time, it was nothing related. Just I wanted to wrap it up. I, at the time, I picked Neil. But in the grand scheme of things, I would, I mean, hands down, Barack Obama. How do you give up, you know, any kind of meeting with him? The guy's phenomenal. But that's just for another day. So anyway, back to you. What How, about me? What ended up uh, happening for you suddenly to trigger in your head, hey, I'm going to do a podcast? Like, did you listen to somebody and like them and then suddenly you thought, I'm going to do this? Or did you have these ideas that you thought, I need to share these with the world? A little of both. I used to, I still do, listen to a lot of podcasts. And as I'm going through my life in recent years with with jobs that bring me an income that allows me to have a pretty good life. And my situation allows for that in many ways. Looking for purpose, figuring out what can I do. And I, I look through like job listings every once in a while. And every job I see listing, I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do anything that anyone's hiring for, basically. What kind of jobs do you even look for, though? <sighs> I, don't, I don't know. I, 
there's I I think I genuinely have applied for one job. I've applied for a few, but one in the last few years that I actually really, really wanted. Which was? It was for, there's a website called Wait But Why, and they were hiring somebody to like work for this website. And I really liked the website and I applied for it and I would have dropped everything and went to and moved out to California to to do it. But I don't know, I guess they didn't want me and I'm not, I'm not even sure what's going on with that website right now. Well, was it about that job that you wanted versus the other jobs you found online? Because that website, the the main writer and my friend Josh and I in episode nine, I think, of the podcast, we had, we've talked about this guy, Tim Urban. He just the, the pieces he would write for are, were so thought provoking. Like if I at this point in my life think really deeply and differently on about some things, it's because of some of what I read there. And I just I thought these are my types of people, the people that put this out there and the people that want to read it. I'm someone that knows that there's so much I haven't thought about yet that I want to understand better. So that's why I would have pursued that job. And then as time went on and I'm still living my life, I thought this is a way for me to, through the people that I know, the people that I find interesting, the people that that have pushed my boundaries and the things that I'm interested in, I want to bring those people to anyone that wants to listen. And maybe if they're willing, that'll it'll push their mind in ways that they hadn't moved in moved it to yet and hopefully like you and i talking about space here i don't know if someone never really talks about space or looks into it i don't know if this even makes sense to them but maybe maybe it brings some curiosity like i i didn't really find that much interest in it until i watched cosmos that that was oh, like yeah the re read the redoing of cosmos three or four years ago i watched it two or three years ago and it just blew my mind how well done that was. And like you talked about the calendar, like human beings didn't exist until after 6 p.m. on December 31st in the history of the universe, something like that. It's like, right. wait a oh, second. Oh, that's right. Taking back my calendar I was talking yeah. about. Yeah, we, we go all, all yeah. over the place here. We do. So on that calendar note, to me, it was, always, it was fascinating because our Earth, I don't think, even came into Exist. I can't remember what month it was. Maybe May. Let's call it. You know something. Yes. And then li- the first single cell life didn't come for months after that. And I'm just talking about month in our calendar. Yeah. And the, then after the, that, this it was- calendar. Just to better explain this, and you and I both know what we're yeah. talking about here. You imagine the history of the universe on a 12 month calendar that we're all familiar with. And in these episodes, maybe one of the episodes of Cosmos is when I first saw it. Neil deGrasse Tyson would go through it and explain when these events happened. And it makes the history of all these things that we're familiar with, but I guess I mentioned human history sometime after like 6 p.m. on December 31st. That's how long human beings have existed for, if that's even the right number, one-fourth of one day out of 365. It means so much more has happened and how long these things take to happen and how much time there has been to allow for everything to happen, even when it's incomprehensible to even think, well, how how human beings exist now when before they didn't, and how that would, you know that would take so long. Okay, we have we've had the time, we, we just can't comprehend it until we put it into a structure that we can comprehend, like right. a calendar of twelve months. Like d- dinosaurs didn't come about until December twenty fifth, which is so down on the calendar, right? Was it that but, really what it was? Yeah, oh, wow. but to us, how long ago are dinosaurs? So that just kind of gives you. And then for um, Christopher Columbus, they say sailed the ocean. Uh, the last minute of December 31st. So it's we're all like in that last, it was either last minute or last second. It was something ridiculously like, holy crap, we are, you know, we're, we're nothing in that. It just, it, it made scene. me totally yeah. reevaluate, continue to reevaluate. What? I guess I don't understand that much. And that's okay yeah. to ever think that I, I did understand anything. And maybe I still don't understand anything. I'm very aware that it's possible I don't understand much of anything. But I feel like things that I definitely didn't understand before, I now have a chance to understand. And that's, it's kind of scary to both realize I don't know that much, but also exciting to realize, oh, there's so much more to learn. Right. Do you know what's cool? And uh, so the moon obviously has no atmosphere. Yeah, have you heard that joke about... Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? No, I did not. I hear heard it had no atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. But the so the moon has no atmosphere, and so for the footprints that you know the astros, astronauts have made will be there for a hundred million years. How cool would it be for some other species to come on the moon somehow? I don't see it 
very likely that anybody was coming to this little quadrant of space and this little, you know, tiny little moon of a, of a planet and, but discover those footprints. I mean, it's just, to me, those things are really cool. Another cool fact, Venus, one year, no, one day in Venus is longer than one year because of the way it spins. Did you know that? I've heard that. I wouldn't have remembered it. So Venus has a very slow rotation around its axis, but so it takes like, I think 225 days, let's call it, to go around the sun, but it takes um, even longer, like maybe not too much longer, but it's like, it's like, let's call it 250 days to go around once on its axis. So one day is longer than one year. And... So I understand that, and I think you can you can verify this. Venus is would be the most inha, inha, inhospitable, inhospitable, inhabitable, inha, inhabitable planet of all the planets. Like most of them are. I mean, they yeah. all are, but that one it would be because it's this constant yeah. gas and oh, heat. it's it's hotter. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, it's and it's not even the closest. Yes, which is kind of strange Mercury to is learn. closest, but Mercury does not have any atmosphere, so Mercury. Its temperature fluctuates a lot versus Venus has that thick atmosphere, which, by the way, could be very much like our our future because Earth is a twin planet, essentially, of Venus. And they're, you know, they've scientists have found, I believe, evidence that Venus a long time ago, long, long, long time ago, had evidence of geography or, you know, water or something like that where it was similar to Earth. And now it's so inhospitable and inhabitable because they've got this thick atmosphere because of all the carbon um i think carbon dioxide and you know the greenhouse gases is my understanding um of it but yeah so it's, venus is very interesting it heated though. up within its atmosphere yeah the because of- there's the atmosphere is so thick so when the heat comes in it's trapped in it's it's trapped inside it can't escape okay you know and maybe it can but not it doesn't escape easily versus our atmosphere for example where right now it's in a good balance but if we keep having all these emissions uh and i'm not talking about in the next 50 years necessarily, but, you know, in the future, it's it's re- irreversible at this. I mean, it, it likely will be. And like the good balance that Earth has, has had, will have for some time, good enough balance is what has allowed species to exist. Right. And it hasn't always been there. You know, Earth is, I mean, how many ice ages have we had? I, I can't tell you the number, but we've obviously not always been this way. Mm-hmm. We've had a very inhospitable to humans climate throughout our time. And so the thing is, Earth is in a con, I mean, Earth is going to be here. I'm not worried about Earth being here or not being here. It's humans that I'm thinking are not going to necessarily be here the way we carry on, you know, even just with each other, with fighting each other, with, you know, the way we have a lack of care for the planet. You know, temperatures keep rising around places. You're going to end up having more mosquitoes you're going to have more problems that different animals are going to do different things than they're used to doing and those let's say mosquitoes are going to go around carrying viruses all these things that we're very susceptible to you know you got a little outbreak and everybody freaks out they stop traveling to the caribbean but Mm. guess what people live there they're still going to get infected they're going to come up here wherever it is there's people are going to travel earth is you know a global place it's not a fixed situation where you just stay in one spot and don't get sick but and I, I do not consider myself to be an expert on this in any way, but I just I like to be aware that okay, there's there's stuff happening, and I don't know exactly, but I'll, I'll trust I'll 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 trust the people that suggest that I need to consider doing things differently, and that we all need to for the sake of our future. Because even if somehow they're wrong, which I don't think they are, but if they are, okay, well, this still, this shouldn't hurt us. Right, yeah, exactly. And I just, I just wish everyone would take that, that approach. You don't even need to agree with them. Just say, there, there's a probability somewhere, whether it's 10%, 90%, or 100%, that the, the climate change caused by humans is happening. Whatever that number actually is, even though some people believe it's 100%, some people say it's 0%, it's somewhere between that 1%, 99, somewhere in between. For the good of our future uh, descendants, I think we just need to kind of assume it's going to be 100 until we, we know for sure that it's zero. Yep. And actually that argument reminds me of, or not argument, but that what you just said reminds me of something I just saw the other day on uh, some like late show. I think Pete, Pete Buttigieg yeah. was on. And he was saying, you know, that I think 
I can't remember which host was asking him, but he was like, well, why you, right? You're so young, blah, blah, blah. Couldn't you just wait a little bit till you got more pepper in your hair or salt and pepper <laughs> yeah. or whatever in your hair? And he goes, well, I'm, I think it's good to be young because – I'm looking out for what's going to be the future in 50 years when I'm older, right? Like he's actually vested in his own interest. I mean, he didn't put it that way, but here's, you know, a lot of our politicians, a lot of our presidents are old. Mm -hmm. They, they basically like, Hey, I'm just looking for my now and I'm out. They're not thinking about the generations after them. I mean, people like Barack Obama, yes, because he's a very nice person in my opinion. And he actually is a thoughtful human, but a lot of people don't think that far. And so, to me, I thought that was actually a cool point. Maybe we do need somebody who's younger, or at least. Or I don't care if they're younger, as long as they're thinking about these issues and they care about them. I think the days of longtime politicians becoming president is is over. Obama, Trump, and whatever happens next here. I just, was it Ukraine? Some TV comedian guy was elected oh, really? their president. I remember, I, was it Iceland a few years ago? Some school teacher or just someone that really wasn't famous somehow. Right. One that I think that's going to happen in, in some cases good, in some cases bad. But I think the thought that okay, we need to vote for this person because they've done all this for all these years. No, it's going to be right. someone. It's going to be a popularity contest of some kind, and that'll be interesting. There's so much, so much we could talk about. I think we should move move in a direction here. Let's, so I want, I still want to get a better understanding. You, you mentioned initially uh, raised in Bahrain Correct. and in Canada in the United States. I've had a few people on previous episodes that have lived in at least two countries, like grew up somewhere and then end up living here. And I, I always find that fascinating. What can you tell someone like me who's traveled the world somewhat or someone that's never left the United States? What, what can you explain about your upbringing that you think is so useful to you having lived in and been raised in these different places and now being here? Well, I think it's, I mean, just me. So I, Obviously, lived many years in Bahrain, many years in Canada, now many years in the U.S. On top of that, I've studied abroad in Mexico, studied abroad uh, in Costa Rica. That was just one month, but still did a lot, saw a lot. And I, when I finished my undergrad, I wanted to go to India because I never lived in my, you know, homeland, as they say, in my in my parents' country, yeah. and you know, and I still have obviously very Indian feeling and root, cultural roots. So I went there for four months. And so I've lived, sort of call it live, in these places. And I think it's helpful to see other cultures because I think it just makes you very accepting and realize we're all humans at the end of the day. You know, we all have differences, yes. But how much do those differences really matter in the grand scheme of things? I think it's something more worth celebrating than being critical of. You know, I think it's really cool when you go to Mexico and you have all these colors and the amazing food and architecture. And I mean, to me, every time people are like, oh, I go to Mexico, I went to Cancun or some kind of beach. Great. I absolutely go to those beaches. They're beautiful. But go inside. Mexico is one of the best countries. I mean, my, one of my favorite countries that I've traveled to, and I've been to over 20, I think 23 countries. Mm -hmm. And it is just phenomenal. They've just so much rich history, uh, heritage, culture, the architecture is stunning because it's got a lot of European influences, but it's also got its own kind of spin on things. And I just think people need to see that kind of thing. And uh, one example I have of where I got to influence somebody, Jason, my husband, he didn't do much traveling except kind of the Caribbean, you know, the cruises and the beach kind of thing before we met. And I think I've kind of sparked a little bit of a travel bug in him, which is really cool. So we went to Peru actually uh, two years ago, and he, that's where he proposed to me. And since that trip, and actually, no, sorry, I think it was three, two years. Yeah, two years ago was Peru. A year before that, we went to Aruba. And I think the Aruba trip kind of sparked a little bit. Then it was Peru even more. And then we got married two years ago. But last year, we couldn't, we didn't really travel out of the country because I, after I got married, I was applying for a green card and there was a whole process or time where you're not really supposed to leave. Okay. There's like some, you know, legal issues and I can, I could leave because I had the proper authorization document to leave, but it's very discouraged. You know, you don't want to risk coming back, coming back be and being rejected. Right. So it just wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. So we went to Canada for a wedding. I went to Jamaica for a bachelorette, but it wasn't, we didn't travel together and we kind of kept it to the bare minimum. And this year, actually, we are going in a couple, a few weeks, we're supposed to go to uh, Barcelona, nice. to Santorini. Athens, then Santorini, then Venice. And I've been to Venice before, but 
I always wanted to go back with a loved one, like a romantic loved one, because I'd gone with my brother. Yeah. And it just when I was back, I remember being there and thinking, wow, it'd be so cool to come here with like in, with somebody I'm in a romantic relationship with. And so I'm really excited about that trip. But I think bottom line is you just you learn so much about other people and you kind of get out this bubble that people are in a lot of times, you know, here we kind of go to work, we come home, go to work, come home. It's a lot of the same. Even if we go out to bars, it's the same bars or it's the same area. You see the same, the same people, people you're hanging a lot out of the with. same people. Even if you don't hang out with them, it's like you're seeing a lot of the same colors, a lot of the same, you know, clothing styles, same accents. Everything is similar. Even if you look at when the, you know, Super Bowl weekend happened, NCAA weekend happened, people are coming from out of town and you're just, even they're all from America, but you're hearing all these different accents. And how cool is that? I mean, it's just, you turn around, you're like, hey, that person sounds like they're from the South. I just think that stuff is really cool. And for me, it always helped me to keep an open mind, I think, to people and not be so narrow-minded in terms of cultures. Like I, I love and embrace, you know, cultures very much. And to me, it's easy to go to a place and make friends because one, I moved around a lot, but two, I'm also open to people, to humans generally. What about how well you were received? Because none of these countries, and I guess depending on how you want to call your home country, none of the countries you've ever really lived in have been your home country, which you, you know, your family is yeah. from India. And actually that's a, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I've always had in my life where I've never felt like I've belonged. And it's not that I don't feel like I belong necessarily. It's other people don't let you feel like you belong. For example, I grew up in Bahrain. Bahrain is um, an Arab country. In Bahrain, when you're born there, you don't get citizenship, which is fine with me. That's just not something I grew up even thinking like, oh, I'm born there. I should be a citizen. I was a citizen of India. Mm -hmm. So I grew up being Indian. But you were born in Bahrain? I was born in Bahrain, but that's... That country does not, you have to be Bahraini with, and then if you're Bahraini and you have a child, that person's Bahraini. And probably even if they're born outside of the country, they're still Bahraini. I'm assuming that's how it works. And for me, I never grew up feeling Bahraini because I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I also went to a British school, so I didn't really, it's a very different environment. I grew up learning, you know, essentially my teachers are from England. Half the kids in my class were from England. The... Other half were the richer Bahraini kids that went to an expensive private school. So it was just, it was not a very Bahraini experience in that sense, you know. And then when I'd go to India, we'd go every summer to India. We'd spend two months there the whole summer, our vacation, because my dad wanted us to go. You know, we'd hang out with my dad's side of the family, mainly. And I didn't, they don't let you feel very Indian because they call you NRIs, which is non-resident Indians. They they never look at you like you're one of them because you're, I mean, essentially you're not, right? Yeah. You you have the privilege you're of, you're visiting and you have the privilege of growing up in a different country that's not India and in, in a, being in a rich country like Bahrain, especially with the things that you have. And, you know, I grew up with like sta- helpers, like we might put a nanny and, you know, people that- What like were your parents Gardner doing in Bahrain? So my dad, um, he had his, he was a CEO of two companies, of two IT companies. I mean, he started from the ground up. He wasn't, He didn't come there as that. He made his way to that. And my mom was a professor, assistant professor, I think, but I don't know, professor essentially, uh, of chemistry in the University of Bahrain. So she did the whole academia angle and she's she's got her PhD. She's a brilliant lady. She's the smartest person I know. She's also my favorite person. I don't know if I should say that because it's recorded. (laughs) (laughs) I love my mom. She'll appreciate it, I'm sure. (laughs) I love my mom. Uh, But she did that. And then so we, this is just how it is though in the East. Like even in India, it always boggles my mind. Even the people that don't have money somehow have help because someone is always needing money more and is poor. India has a bill over a billion people. You have a lot of help and a lot of things that don't happen here. Here we have things like minimum wages, which is wonderful because then you have, you don't have that culture where you can just you know, where you have that help that you're not maybe necessarily paying enough. Now, I know my family, for example, did pay well, but not everybody does that. Mm-hmm. You got to remember, right? It's like a lot of people that just kind of want to get the cheapest person they can. And so that side of things I didn't really enjoy as much in Bahrain and even in India. That It's a different culture, you know, absolutely. Um, but I kind of forgot what I was saying now. So you 
you didn't feel like oh, you had oh, a home. Oh, sorry. Yes, I didn't feel like I was home. And then when I went to Canada and I immigrated there, and again, I don't feel like I belong because one, I sound different. I had a British accent when I first moved. I mean, because I grew up in a British school. Then on top of that, my clothes are different. You know, I wasn't wearing what whatever was cool in Canada. Not People were not mean to me. They're very nice to me, but you just don't. Canadians are nice. Canadians are very nice. We obviously have our rotten ones too, but generally are they was, kind to or just nice like minnesota nice type of nice no they're kind they're not they're actually good generous people. kind they're very helpful. nice people helpful okay i would say most people not not everybody but there were a lot of i mean there's obviously just that same culture here it's like there's some bullies i didn't get bullied but there were definitely bullies mm-hmm. but i never felt enough canadian i do feel canadian the most i would say however other people sometimes now in the u.s look at me and say well you don't look canadian or you don't you know, how are you Canadian? So Canada didn't let me in Canada. When I lived there, I felt Canadian. Let me put it that way. Yep. Nobody let me feel like I wasn't Canadian because immigration is so prevalent there, especially in Toronto. Everybody, you know, most people are, are immigrants. You, I came to Can, uh, the U S and the U S is the first time that I didn't feel Canadian in that sense where people made me feel like I wasn't really Canadian because I was born in the Middle East because I immigrated to Canada because I don't look Canadian. My first week in law school, uh, some guy goes to me. He goes, so where are you from? And I said, Canada. And he goes, well, you don't look Canadian. And I said, well, what does a Canadian look like? <laughs> and he literally goes, well, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. I was just flabbergasted. I mean, is that how you think about Americans? Because guess what? We're not very different, right? So it's like... Yeah. If you think American American is blonde hair, blue eyes, well, then you're being very racist to people that are not looking like that one person. Mm-hmm. So it's been, I think it's tough always to have that question asked of me because I know people really want to know is where you're really from. That's what I even say. They go, where are you really from? And then I say, well, my background is Indian, right? But I, I feel Canadian. I am Indian. I definitely feel Indian also. I'm sort of a mix of sorts, but... It's frustrating to not know, kind of have that one identity, but it's also cool to have multiple. So I, I think it's, I'm fine with it overall. I'm not losing any sleep over like, it that way. And I imagine that having these different experiences all over the world has given you some advantages just for your own personal growth. And we'll get into the personal growth segment pre- pretty soon. But I, I find that traveling just even a little bit here and there helps me grow in all these ways, but you having lived and spent extended amounts of time in all these places, I'd imagine puts you a step ahead, at least in some, some ways when you're competing for a job or whatever you, you've done in the past. Yeah. And I guess I don't know about the job aspect because I don't know what they're looking for necessarily. It's not like I go in there and put all this stuff out there in my answers, you know, I've lived here and there, so I'm good fit and I would be great in meeting or interacting with all the employees. You know, that's not something I say. Okay. I just think in life it's helpful. Yes. You know, not necessarily. And maybe in my job, it does help while I'm in my job, not interviewing necessarily. But for example, I have all kinds of clients from all over the place. I have clients that are rich. I have clients that are, you know, don't have money. I have clients that just every walk of life. Because I I represent people that have been very catastrophically injured. Everybody gets injured, right? There's no social class of when you get injured. You can get injured easily on the highway sitting in a car or if a doctor or some medical professional does something wrong on you and you're in a procedure. We do med mal, medical malpractice and uh, a lot of that. So in that way, it doesn't discriminate. And it helps me to be able to talk to everybody because I've met all sorts of people. You know, Bahrain, it's a really rich country. So there's a whole different way of talking and dealing with certain people there. Mm-hmm. I remember one story I can give you is my mother. So we were in a grocery store and we were in a checkout line and we saw the cashier. So this lady resident, just in my head, I just remember her face. Later, my mom and I were in, this is like a few days later at a mall or something, ran into this lady who was apparently some member of royalty or, you know, down the chain in the royalty in, in Bahrain and a lot of those Middle Eastern countries, there's a lot of people because it's, you know, there's the king, the crown princes, and all their relatives kind of they're cousins. All all, they're all royalty, just different degrees. And we met some lady, and I was a child. I think I was maybe six years old. And I said, oh, did I see you the other day? You know, you look like the lady, the cashier, at blah, blah, blah. 
my mom was so <laughs> embarrassed because she was like, oh my gosh, you're insulting this lady, blah, blah, blah. She didn't say it at the time. So after we went home, she told me she was so embarrassed and she made me call the lady and apologize. So my mom called, dials it, you know, and she's like, oh, hang on. My daughter wants to say something, hands it to me. I'm embarrassed now because I'm like, what's going on? What did I do wrong? And so I'm apologizing. But this is sort of, you meet a lot of, my point is there's different uh, classes in all the places I've been to, you know, even India, there's just, for example, the, when I would visit India, you're not, it was taboo to sit in the front seat with the driver. My uncle like actually had a talk with me, like you should sit in the back seat. And I go, well, why? They're just normal people, right? No, it's not done. That kind of shit bothered me so much. It was just so I would sit in the front seat anyway, because I'm like, I don't care if, you know, if it's just me, but they were like, oh, it looks bad. You then having these different backgrounds mixed together, it sounds like you don't like to abide by some of the cultural norms just because you don't, you don't, you don't, well, you explain what I'm, what yeah. maybe you think I'm. I'm so I think I understand of. what you're saying. I think no matter where I go, I mean, I try to be respectful, but if it's something I don't agree with or believe in, I'm not going to necessarily follow. Like if it's something that's going to get me. That's going to put me at risk. Yeah, obviously, I'm going to follow it. Like if they're like, oh, don't go to the beach at night. Okay, I'm not going to because the men are going to be creepy, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, there are a lot of creepy people in some of the foreign countries I've been to. You know, some of the more, I'd say, third world countries, more so India, for example. But if it's something that's like, hey, you're not supposed to sit there because it's just not proper or it's not done, that to me is ridiculous. I'm going to do it anyway because that person's a human and I want to talk to them. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think it just depends, but yeah, I kind of do what I want to do. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd imagine that carries over to all aspects of your life and in this yeah. country, especially where it's easier to do what you yeah. want to do. For good or bad, I do what I, I do what I want to do. With that, let's transition into the personal growth segment of the podcast, and this is, I think, now the third episode where I've really focused on this and. I'd imagine you have plenty that you can share on ways that you have recognized growth in your life, but I I will bring up this one particular thing. I remember texting with you some months ago and you sharing with me that you had cancer. Yep. (laughs) And I'd imagine you've learned a lot from that ordeal and I still don't know if I properly understand exactly what you went through, so maybe you can explain it. Sure. So, um... I mean, I got, I learned last year. So I remember the day before I even learned anything was wrong. We went, my, I had bought my husband a hot air ballooning ride, like part of his Christmas present. We went hot air ballooning. So I remember that as being the last day where I was ignorant and blissful, you know? Mm -hmm. And the very next day, I got some bad results from a pap smear. And, I remember reading them and my, you know, when your heart sinks and you just stomach drops and you're just like, I'm, I'm a very chatty person. And for the first like, time in a very long time, I was quiet. My boss, Bill Harper and I were driving back from some CLE we were at and like a seminar and I'm reading the results in the car and I just didn't say a word. And I, I think he could tell something was wrong because I'm not usually quiet and he didn't say anything. And then I just remember bawling my eyes out. When I got to the office and that wasn't even bad. I mean, it it was bad, but what I was to learn later, because every step of the way, it was kind of a worse diagnosis. First, it was like, you know, cervical dysplasia and, you know, essentially bad cells down on my cervix. And then they were like, well, I went to the doctor and they they had to do this thing called a colcoscopy biopsy where they put in a, a, like a microscope or something and they excise a piece of your cervix that they put a dye or like vinegar to see what areas look bad. And then they take out the part that they think is suspicious. Mm -hmm. So I took that and they, at the whole time they're like, Oh, you know, don't worry. It's not cancer. It's, um, it's just dysplasia. We can fix it. It's, this is what we're likely going to do is a leap procedure. They just go and kind of, I think cauterize or cut out the bad tissue. And when those results came back, they're like, Oh, it's worse than we thought. It's, uh, what do they call it? It was adenocarcinoma in situ. 
And they're like, don't worry, it's not cancer. It's stage zero cancer, but it's not cancer. Of course, this whole time, I'm, I'm already freaking out just from the bad cells and the worst. And I'm, you know, really upset. Then they, they said, well, I don't qualify anymore for a leap procedure with what it is. They'll have to do a cold knife cone surgery where they go in and take out a bigger chunk of my cervix. And they hope to get it. So they did that. There was a whole surgery. I, you know, you go under for that. And... And this was last summer? This is, no, this is by now, my first surgery was September 20. So last September fall. 7th. So yeah. So last I mean, fall. it kind of was summer through the fall. Okay. Because every time I had a procedure, it takes some time to get the results and then for, you know, it to heal enough to do the surgery, things like that. So like, it was essentially, uh, I'm trying to think here. I think the hot air balloon ride was July. So July onwards, life was hell. And then I had my cold knife cone surgery that they're like, okay. So I remember being at a convention, a in summer convention in, in August when they got their results. And I'm just trying to think here, the timing's not making sense. You know, I think the cold knife cone was in August because I got the results of the surgery when I was at a lawyer convention and Jason was at a bachelor party out of town and the doctor calls me and she goes, are you somewhere, you know, where you can like, you can sit down and talk. And I was like, oh. like your stomach just drops again. Because mm. every time that they call, it's it's worse than we thought. And she said, well, it's cancer. And it was just like, I just cried. At the time I was on the phone, I think I could keep it together enough. And then I went back to the, the seven, well, I was, it was a lunch portion. So there was a speaker. And I, don't, I think the rest of that lunch was a blur. Because, you know, who do you go and just suddenly be like, hey, I got this call of cancer, you know? So you went back to do what you were... Oh, no, I went. I suddenly, after the call, I called my... I called Jason. He didn't pick up. So I called I called my dad, bald. Call, you know, my talk my mom, bald. Then Jason called me back because I'd called his friend and said, I need to talk to you right now. And he called me. You know, I'm crying and he's upset because he's like, oh, I wish I was there with you. And... Sorry, I don't mean to cry. <laughs> Do whatever is normal for you. Uh, with this stop crying is like the normal <laughs> um, Anyway, so then I went back to the seminar, and I think it's yeah. At some point, I'm talking to people because they can. And I'm just every time person I'm telling, I'm just crying. I'm like, this is going to be a really fun weekend, not you know, just because mm -hmm. it was just so fresh, you know. And it was sort of the thing that you, I was fearing the most because this whole time it's like, oh shit. The first results were like, oh, it's high risk cancer, cervical cancer. And then everyone's trying to reassure me, but it kept getting worse. And now it's, of course, cancer. So the doctor I talked to, the one who did my cold knife cone in August, she goes, well, I recommend like a hysterectomy, you know, but I wanted to get a second opinion, third opinion. That's one of the things I'd recommend to anybody going through a medical situation is get second opinions, third opinions. Not that the first one was a bad opinion. It's just you want to know your options, you know, mm -hmm. because for me, the one of the biggest things was I didn't have children and I wanted children. Actually, Jason and I were the whole purpose of that summer was we were going to start trying to have kids. And that obviously went by the wayside. But for me, I if I'd had a hysterectomy, I wouldn't be able to have a kid. So, you know, I they were like, well, you might be a candidate for a trachelectomy, which is like when they just take your cervix only and not your uterus and your um, you know, the parametria, every, basically it's just your cervix versus all the other stuff that's going on up in there. Yeah. And so I end up, uh, having to do a second cold knife cone surgery and a pet MR scan to see if I could qualify for the, um, uh, for the trachelectomy. So I went through another surgery that was just awful. I mean, and I also went through a whole IVF, um, retrieval process in case somehow in the process that, you know, they found out my ovaries had cancer or somehow my ovaries get damaged in the process. I was, just, you know, you don't know. That's the problem with cancer. You just don't know. It's a big effing question. Mark. The retrieval was that to just take some... it out, just to take out eggs and make uh, embryos. Okay. So, so even if you couldn't carry in the somebody future, else, someone right. Could and still. actually I, in part, one of the most heartwarming things was, you know, my sister-in-law, Jason's sister, she offered to be a surrogate, which is, I mean, one of the most, kind things anybody could even offer to somebody. And so that was really nice to have that in my head. Like, Hey, if it doesn't work out for me, 
we can still have, you know, our kid because we, that's what we took out the embryos. And part of the whole reasoning was the doctor had said, well, if you're going to do it, this is the time because who knows what they'll, what will happen in surgery. And so this is my, the re- reproductive endocrinologist. So I went through the whole process and it was, it's pretty bad. Actually, it was, it was, it sucked. You got to, you know, stick yourself with injections every night and, you know, uh, evening and the morning, uh, just a lot of hormones that nobody wants to have, like, as in like your actual body, it's not, a, it's not fun having all those hormones in you. And it just really messed up subsequent, um, like periods for me. It just made it very painful. So I did that. Then I had my trachelectomy at Mayo and that was, um, so far so good. I mean, I've had issues like infections and other, but you know, generally, my understanding is I should be good and I've got my follow-up coming in a few weeks to just to see if things are still good. But it was definitely a journey. Um, very sad. I cried a lot, especially in the first uh, few months, just when it was really fresh. I'd drive home. I listened to one song on repeat, like almost all the time, like in the car on repeat, in the shower, at home. It was, uh, it was a Nina Simone song. And it's like, I ain't got no, I've got life. And so there's a couple of different versions of that song. And there's one that's very sad. Mm-hmm. So I listen to the sad one on repeat. And then I noticed like as I was getting used to my new norm, you know, I started listening to the happy one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so now I still listen to it sometimes here and there. And I will, and Jason's always like, what, what's wrong with you? Why do you not like listen to different music? Cause I, I'm a very repeat kind of person for music too. And anyway, I listen to the happy one now, but. So I'm, I'm generally good. I don't think about it all the time. It's not taking up every spot in my brain, but it definitely um, still like, for example, you just saw, I still get emotional when I put myself back in that situation or, you know, and even with what I do in my job, like a lot of times we have people that have misdiagnosed with cancer, things like, so it's always around, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can't go a day without hearing cancer from somebody like somebody's got a loved one that they've lost through cancer or whatever it is. As we have this conversation in the latter part of April 2019, what's the confidence level by the medical professionals that you're going to be okay? And what's your confidence level knowing that throughout the whole process, what you've thought and what they've been telling you weren't exactly in line, it sounds like. So the confidence level, the medical professionals, they don't really give you a specific one except what the stats say. So I think... I had like cervical cancer 1A2 was my staging. And so with that stage and doing a trachelectomy, it has a certain percentage of a five-year survival rate. And it's pretty good. You know, it's high high 90s is the rate. It would have been maybe a little bit better if I did the hysterectomy. Because, you know, the more you're taking out, the more potential cells you're taking out that could have cancer. Mm -hmm. But... With everything they told me, I felt pretty comfortable doing the trachelectomy. And, you know, my when they took my second cold knife cone out, there was nothing in there. There was no cancer at all in those cells. And then they when they did the trachelectomy, whatever they took out had no cancer. So overall, I feel pretty good about it. But with something like cancer, you can never, you know, say, yeah, I'm sure I'm, I'm good. So I would say I feel comfortable, but you always have to be cautious. And as the weeks roll by here, are you, how are you feeling? How is, like, is life, how how close to normal is life now compared to before or will it never be? I guess I don't really understand. I think life is pretty normal right now, you know, as in this very moment. I feel just kind of like I did before. I don't really feel too much different, except obviously anytime cancer comes up, I emotionally have changes, Mm -hmm. but physically I'm feeling the same. I'm feeling fine. However, coming up in a few months when we try to start having kids, I think life's going to go screwy again because we're going to try to do the IVF implantation. So the embryos that we have, we're going to try and put them in me. And to do that, if everything, if I get a go from my, you know, cancer doc, from my endocrinologist, reproductive endocrinologist, from my uh, maternal fe- fetal medicine doctor, if everything is a go and the process goes smoothly when they put it in and actually sticks or whatever, that's obviously going to be different than somebody just naturally getting pregnant from, like, you know, other people do. Yeah. So that I think will be difficult because I'll have to do all the injections and all the meds again. And that was one of the worst things, I think, to go through. Just, it's just, it's a lot. On top of everything else, it was a lot. 
knowing that that's coming, I'd imagine then you're you're excited about the possibility again to begin the process of having your own kids, but this this probably makes it way more daunting than it's ever been before. Yeah, I mean, I don't. We never really started trying, so I can't say if it's. We I don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. Uh, but I would say this is definitely something I'm not necessarily looking forward to trying because I know it's going to be a lot on my body. But I'm obviously hopeful, and I hope it all goes well. And I just hoping we can have a baby and a healthy baby, and that's really the bottom line, you know. Mm-hmm. If you can summarize what you've learned, how you've grown from this experience, that obviously will be continuing in some of the new ways. You're going to have to to deal with some things moving forward what what is it that you've learned that that's going to be valuable moving forward i think having the diagnosis of cervical cancer has taught me that i really have to put my health first you know my whole life i've kind of just gone through not thought about health consequences you know as young people we always feel invincible yo i'm not going to get that nothing's going to happen to me and what I, th- I think I've learned is like, no, everybody can get something. It's everything is possible with people, with us as humans. And so I have to take my health into my own hands, whether it means, you know, not necessarily this cancer, but just generally being healthy, exercising, building my immune system, you know, doing things that are good for me, not just because they're fun. And it's hard because we still want to obviously do things that are fun, like not sleep as much at night. But, you know, it's important, I think, to put your health first and think about the long term, not just like your short term gains. Also, I think it's important as a patient to advocate for yourself. You know, if a doctor says something that, for example, when I didn't gone in, uh, not last year when I got diagnosed, but I'd gone in a year and a few months before for a pap smear. And the doctor said, oh, well, you're not due for another month. And I'm thinking, I just follow her recommendation. You know, that's her doctor. And obviously, had they caught it then, it would have been earlier. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, you know, where it's like, why? People should just, I think, we need to be more read up on what can happen and why. And and then just speak louder, you know, say, no, I go get a second opinion if needed. You know, money is nothing in the long run when you don't have your health. If you're not alive to, to use it, what does it matter, you know? Yeah. Might be a, a tough transition here, but let's let's go back to something that we talked about earlier. And one of the more recent times we saw each other was, I guess, kind of randomly at a like a regional Toastmasters training event. And we've been both been aware that we're both in Toastmasters, which I guess I explained it as a organization, a club where you practice your public speaking. I think that's that's the main point, but also there's some leadership and, and training opportunities there. And in this particular time, because of our roles on the board of directors for our local club, we were both at this area or regional training. Just coincidentally, you saw me standing there and I think we were both running a little bit late and we went in and we, we took this course together and we, we chatted a little bit, which was super cool. And you mentioned a Toastmaster speech that you gave relating, I think, to... Uh, the space uh, stuff the, yes. and the lucky you. So what? why are you in Toastmasters and what do you think you've gained most from being in that organization? So I joined Toastmasters because I wanted... Because as a personal injury lawyer, we have to go to the courtroom from time to time. But it's with cases going the way they do these days, which is they settle more often than not before trial. You're not in the courtroom as much as... I would like at least, you know, at least I would like to be in there much more regularly. Uh, However, we don't get to use our public speaking skills or work on them because we're not in the court as much. So I wanted to have a way that I could regularly speak that would make it less daunting every time I'd have to go to court where Mm -hmm. it was just more natural to be able to speak. And a lot of times we speak, it's not a rehearsed speech. It's not, it's usually, this is the topic I have to discuss and it can go, you know, you have kind of a framework in your mind. But the judge is asking you questions or your uh, answer or responding to the opposing counsel's arguments, you're not going to obviously have a speech scripted. So you have to kind of learn how to talk on your toes. 
And Toastmasters, I thought, would be nice. My mom was in it. And she actually is in it. And she told me it was a great way to kind of become a better speaker and to talk on, you know, on your feet, things like that. So I joined. And the group I joined, it was the it was on my way home. So it's it's convenient. It's Friday at 3. So it's, it's just a convenient time and place. We're a little smaller group. And I definitely think it's helped in that I have these opportunities to sit there and, you know, make a speech and then to give it. And because of my life being very busy with work and stuff, I don't sit there and rehearse speeches as I probably should. But what's nice about it is it gives me that kind of a similar feel as if I were to go and talk in an impromptu situation, go in court and talk, because you're not going to sit there and rehearse it necessarily 10 times or have that luxury to do that because, you know, we're very busy in our jobs. And so I like that it's, it gives me that opportunity, even if I'm not talking about the law. And obviously, I could make a speech about something to do with my work, but uh, frankly, I find the space stuff more interesting, <laughs> although I do really enjoy my work. But, um, you know, I just, I really enjoy the, also the people. I love my, the club members are very nice people. We have a good group. A lot of positive feedback, I would say, is my feel about Toastmasters. Everybody's trying to give constructive criticism and build you up, not put you down. Yeah, the point is to become better at it, and everyone enters it at a different point in their their skill level. And, and most people seem to improve quite a bit by just giving speeches. And I like how you mention the not rehearsing it, not preparing as much as maybe you think you should, because there's so many other things going on. That ends up being me. I end up not even prepare, like starting until maybe the Saturday or the Sunday before my Monday night speech. And this most recent one I gave. I pretty much put everything together that afternoon. Oh, that's what I do. I write them the, like an hour or two before the actual speech. And I know the time I rehearse or even talk it out is on my drive to Toastmasters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds exactly <laughs> like what I do. And that's probably not how they envision it back right. <laughs> in Toastmasters International. But I'm sure it's not uncommon to do that. But what it does, and I think you alluded to it, is just knowing how to structure something that you're going to say and, and knowing that you have the skills to at least throw something together, make it fairly coherent, be better at it in general, like trend upwards with how well you deliver whatever it is every time. And that's a skill that I probably had a little bit of before, but I know I'm better at it now. So if, if someone told me, Kurt, here tomorrow, we need you to present a, whatever this random thing. I don't know why someone would ask me to do that, but maybe at some point, that's what I'm preparing for. I would like to think that if I do some things well in the coming years, maybe someday someone's going to want me to speak to something. And I want to be good when I'm there. I don't want to be learning how to speak in front of an audience for the first time in, in years and years and years. I want to like show up and, and do so well that people think, wow, we want to have him speak at the next thing. And, right. and that's kind of what I'm, pre I'm preparing myself for this unknown thing that might happen. And if it never happens, fine. And I don't know that everyone has a use for it and maybe most people won't i might not really but i find just the people i like them in my group as you said with yours and there's so many clubs and i'm, I'm sure some are like club like uh, business club like you have them at your workplace over the noon hour mine's not like that mine's called free thought toastmasters so a lot of the people in my group are free thinkers atheists agnostics like me not everybody but mostly those are the people that this group kind of draws from and I, I like those are my there's not a lot of us that are like out openly walking around the world. And I was able to find a lot of people that think like me there and they give speeches that are on all kinds of topics that I think are so interesting and not really bashing anything in particular. They're just they're thinking differently than the average population does. And I, I really enjoy my group and my group has a has an open house on May 20th, Monday night, May 20th. People are interested. I will be linking this stuff. I should add that to my calendar. So that I'm gonna, I don't know who I'm gonna have for my club, but someone in that one of my next couple episodes, I'm going to have on talking about my club in particular and on 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 the podcast. And I I just I think it's a it's something people can join if they want to just get better at something. How however much use of it they they might even see themselves having in the future. Yeah, public absolutely. speaking. When most people are. Well, what's the old joke that? Like the people's biggest fear in life. Like I think people would rather die than some people than having to like publicly speak. They're so fearful. Oh, of it. some people say that, and I understand it. You know, I don't. Public speaking is difficult. It's not something natural. Every time I get up to speak in front of people, it's like my brain is suddenly it shuts off a little bit. It doesn't feel as normal as it does when you're just in a room talking to people. Even 
you know, I, I can work a crowd, but it's so different when you're up there. For some reason, it's like your brain just isn't. It's a new. Used to it's it. It's like a new skill that you don't do it until you start doing it. And when you start doing it, there's a lot of pressures that I think a lot of people feel because everyone's staring at them and you're forced to perform and sound coherent and be interesting. And there's so much you need, you feel like you need to do. And if you're not doing it, you can kind of tell because people look at you like, uh, what's this person talking about? And you don't want that response. You want to learn how to get a better response. People laughing, people like really intently listening. Like you can learn how to do that better. Which is strange because I'm, well, I used to dance competitively when I was in college, Indian dance team. Like, so we do like Bollywood style or Bhangra and some hip hop and uh, stuff like that. And I never had an issue dancing on stage in front of thousands of people. It was, that did not do anything to me. It was fun. It was exhilarating. I wasn't nervous much. You know, like obviously you have some jitters like, oh, hope we do well kind of thing, but it wasn't the same type of nerve wracking experience that public speaking can have. Isn't that weird? Is I no, I, I get it because public speaking and one thing about it, you're generally you're, you're the only person. So That's if you're true. dancing, even if it's two people or way more than yeah. two people, it does, it takes all the eyes not on you. I mean, they're, they're looking in different places possibly, which I think it's, is something different than that active for that type of performing. That's true. I didn't think of that. Back for the Being Wrong segment with Anu Chidasama. Good job. Anu, we covered a lot of things in this episode, but here's the point where I ask you something that you were wrong about. Now let's look back on your life. Oh, geez. I was wrong about a lot of things. Example, eating cheese and, uh, what was it called, bagel bites today for lunch because that is nutritionally bankrupt. You're never <laughs> getting that, that lunch back. No, never getting it back. I also had it for dinner last night because I just love cheese and I love <laughs> crackers. And the combo of both of them along with this little jam is just so delicious. It's like crack for my taste buds. Anyway, if I were to think more significant things, yes. I would say, you know, when I was younger, I think my whole life I've always kind of rushed through things. You know, you have elementary school, middle school, high school. Then the next step is college and the next step is the next, you know, whatever you're doing after that for post um, undergraduate education, which in my case was law school. And then from law school, it's got to get a job as an attorney. And I think what I was wrong about is how I went about things. I think I never really stopped and thought out where do I want to be 10 years from now if I really look at my interests in life and what would make me happy and then actually going about my now in order to achieve that goal. You know, for example, I love traveling. Uh, traveling is my one of my favorite things in the world. I love space. I love all these things about space that's so cool. If I had just thought more about what my interests were, and at the time I didn't know about space, but let's say traveling, I definitely knew. I should have thought about, well, what do I really want to do in life and how am I going to get there? And I do love my job. I'm a personal injury lawyer. I obviously love it. But I never really thought very hard about where I was going every step I made. I would just kind of end up seeing what opportunity came up and then I would go with it. Perfect example, when I was in my first year of undergrad, I went to a business school in Canada. It was the Schulich School of Business. And it's one of the you know top business schools in Canada, even for undergraduate programs. And everybody in my class, I mean, I, I went to a class of, so I was in a specific program called the International Bachelors of Business Administration. Only, I think it was only 40 or 60 kids were accepted out of thousands of applicants, like several thousand people would apply, 40 kids get in. I got in. I was very fortunate. So in my first year after undergrad, I was looking for a job. I didn't actually look very hard at the time. This is a thing I would go back and be a lot more precise about what I was doing, be a lot more thoughtful. I think that was lacking in my immaturity. I went to college when I was 17. I was two years ahead. So I think I lacked a lot of that maturity that I, you know, you kind of get over the course of your life. And you still got in, which sounds pretty impressive. I still got in and I still um, did just fine afterwards. I ended up going to University of Wisconsin for law school. I mean, I didn't, not a failure. <laughs> I'm just saying that there are certain things I should have thought about or gone about more thoughtfully. Well, do you do that now? I, well, let me get to that. So, but back to that story. So I was 
my mom, we were at a gas station and we pull up. It was one of those stations in Canada and Mississauga where you have to actually go in to pay, which was probably the last one around where you, they don't have a credit card slot. Yep. As I go inside and the guy, a Palestinian guy, Ghazi Kariba, he goes, hey, baby, what? They just call everyone baby. Like baby, not like creepy baby, but like baby, like <laughs> okay. child, like child, not like okay. – Hey, baby. It was more like, baby, what are you doing? If you say so. So anyway, he asked me what I was doing. I was like, oh, I'm looking for a job right now. He goes, well, I'm hiring. And again, I met this really amazing institution with some top minds and, you know, doing things in a whole different area. Like we were, we're st- I'm studying business, international business. And then here I am getting offered a job as a cashier, which, by the way, is just fine. But that's not going to set me up for anything in that field. Mm-hmm. But instead of saying, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And keeping on looking in something that would be relevant to my field. I was like, okay. And that summer I worked at the gas station (laughs) as a cashier. And, you know, it was a very fun summer and I didn't have to work very hard. I had to go be a cashier, but which is hard work at the time. But that gas station hardly had any customers because it was that old pump that didn't have a credit card thing. So nobody wanted to come there. So I little traffic, you know, occasionally people would come. I did have some people steal some gas for me. And then my boss tried to pin it on me saying it was my fault to not get their license plates or to even let them go off in the first place. Well, he didn't have cameras. Anyway, fifth off point. But my point is like, I should have been more thoughtful in every job I went for as to how is that, how is that going to get me where I really want to be? And to, as to answer your question, where am I, am I doing it right now? I don't know. I would say I've been doing it more recently in the sense that I'm the current job I have. I love it. I represent people who have been very injured and we are working on very high level cases. So certainly that is helping me and it's, it's setting me up in a career that I actually want to be in, but I've definitely made some choices in the past where I just kind of went there because the opportunity was there. For another example, I end up going to Eau Claire to live there. I lived there for a year and a half, went to a law firm um, you know, fantastic in the sense they represented very injured people and we did good work there. But was that really in the grand scheme of things going to get me to where I wanted to be in life? I don't think so. I mean, I literally went there because the guy hired me. It wasn't because I wasn't doing the picking. I was just sort of applying randomly. And then if somebody wanted me, I was like, sure. And that's just, if I could go back, I think I would be a lot more thoughtful in my choices and, you know, where, why I did things, why I went to a certain field, let's say even, you know, maybe I would have really enjoyed estate planning. I don't know. I won't know right now because I'm in personal injury. So it's just one of those things where I've never really sat down and thought about it. And that's something I think I need to be more mindful of moving forward. So to have deeper thoughts with clearer direction, a clearer purpose or a vision, and that's something I've gotten into in previous episodes, like really thinking this is where I want the endpoint to be, even though maybe the endpoint is going to be different, but at least have a clear endpoint to make sure that everything that you're doing or most things you're doing lead you in that direction. And if someone offers you a job that's totally unrelated, maybe you don't say no, but let's find a better one to say yes to before we say yes to this one. Right. And I did do some of that in the more recent years where I was just, but it, for me, it's, it was, I always love opportunities, so it's hard to say no to one also. You know, there's always that opportunities is kind of, I've also heard people say you should never turn down an opportunity, right? And to see where it goes. Well, I think I've done that in my life and I just have to kind of rein it back. And It's actually, led you to here. It's led me to here and I love here. You know, I love even my year and a half in Eau Claire. I think that was one of my favorite places and experiences of living there because I met such wonderful people and I really enjoyed the friendships that I made. You know, and I got to live in a small town, which I'd never done before. And to me, 60,000, 60, like six zero, sixty thousand 60,000 people to me was a small town mm-hmm. just with the place I've lived in. Even, even Bahrain, Bahrain's tiny, but it's a country and it doesn't, you know, have a town. I mean, it's town feel, but it's not a small town feel. Yeah. It's also in the Middle East. So it's very different than small town America. So that was really cool for me. And I wouldn't take it back. And I'm not saying I have regrets about my life necessarily, uh, but I'm just saying I think I did things wrong or I could have done them better. No. You've developed a, a better strategy for these things in the past that you, you can now say that you, you did right. them wrong. That's... Although I still do things wrong. I waste too much time watching TV, you know. <laughs> That's common. But it's such a stupid thing to do. We have such finite hours in our lives 
And I am giving up, what, all of my evenings, pretty much, watching television, which, by the way, is riveting. I love shows. I love Game of Thrones and all these shows I could tell you about. But what's the point? You know, why? I don't know. I Everyone I talk to basically is into Game of Thrones. I've, I love that show. I've watched yes. like a half of episode of my life and I missed out on all of this that everyone else has been entertained by. What I've been doing in those hours, one at a time or in like several in a row, if you're, you're binge watching it at some point, it hasn't been more productive. I don't know because I haven't like properly calculated when I would have watched it and what I did not said. But the amount of hours that it's taken you to watch that. For, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I probably use some of that time pretty well. I'm sure some of it I've wasted too. So there's so many ways to misuse time. But I, I really get what you're saying. Actually, for Game of Thrones, I would say that every hour we're spent on it is worth it. <laughs> okay. It's so good. Well, I better start watching right now. <laughs> it's really good. I've got one thought that I'd like to add. Let's do it. So this has nothing to do with what we've talked about. However, I was in church on, we were talking about atheism, blah, 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 earlier. Mm-hmm. And I do go to church with my husband's family on uh, Easter, Christmas. I think that's about it. Okay. But, you know, I have no problem going to church. I think it's a very nice, positive environment. I do find it boring because I just, you know, I didn't grow up reading these scriptures or knowing anything about it. And for me, I think I might have like undiagnosed ADHD because it's hard for me to sit in one spot and listen to somebody. So it was, it, it's always tough, but I always enjoy talking to the playing with the kids, but the kids are getting older, so they're not playing as much. So now I'm like, okay, I'm actually going to listen. So as I'm listening to this uh, sermon, what struck me is nothing about the sermon and the content of it, but actually to do with leadership in America. You know, right now there's people who are lining up to be presidential candidates, and a lot of them are women and the men, and we've never had a female president. And I'm asking myself, well, why don't people want a female president? Why are they so reluctant? Why does somebody get elected over Hillary when Hillary has all this experience? And, you know, to me, it's just all these whys. Mm -hmm. And what what struck me is like every time I've gone to a church, I've always seen a male leader, a pastor is, you know, that's male, priest that's male, Hindu temples, always a man that's kind of running the show it's like a hindu priest who's the main guy and then there's like his women who serve him and who kind of work around him to do things and they're more like the workers at the temple and i think it's very similar to mosque mosque from what i've seen on tv the imams are most they're men they're, i've never seen a female imam they're men who are leading their people and i think that's prevalent in every single place of worship. I mean, maybe some people have women. There but, are some female yeah. pastors in some denominations. But I think States, it's but not a lot. Un- it's uncommon. Think. And so the, the point is, if you're used to having leadership your whole life, people are going to these institutions and that is who you're used to being led by as a man. You know, I can understand why suddenly they get to their, you know, their jobs and now they're looking for male leadership. Something they're looking to their leaders of the country and they're looking for male leadership. And I'm not saying I understand it like, oh, I get it. Let's just keep picking men. I'm just saying maybe that is the issue. And I think what maybe needs to happen more is more females enter these leadership roles in all of these little levels at, at the community level. And eventually when people start seeing more females leading them, they're suddenly going to have that maybe same respect for and maybe listening to these females in positions like the president, you know, the highest level in of office in the country. It's something abnormal that will continue to be abnormal until it's normal. And I, I'm pretty sure throughout history, there's things that have been abnormal that eventually have become normalized because we've reached some tipping point where it starts to happen. And I'm sure at some point, a woman will be elected president of the United States. Maybe it's for 2020. Maybe it's not for way longer. Who knows? But it would be abnormal. It'd be weird, strange, not what they want for a lot of people. I imagine to me, it wouldn't matter. It's just I want the best person for the job. And oh, absolutely. I think a lot, enough people probably think that now or it can happen. But there's also a lot of people that probably would never vote for a woman for president for whatever of these reasons that might relate to just always authority figures have always been men, men in their lives. So why now would they switch to it being a woman? Why would they right. vote for a woman? And if you think about an example where women, a woman has been in leadership 
in a leadership role, to think of England, right? You got the queen. Yes. You got a female figurehead who is the absolute top honcho. And now you've got you got a female prime minister. You know, somewhere where you're used to seeing that queen as the leader, as a top figurehead, whether or not she's actually leading and doing things in a level. I don't know what level, the queen does besides make public appearances, but maybe yeah, she does a lot. She eats very healthy from what I understand. <laughs> okay. She is like we the can same all learn diet. From her. She has the same diet every day is what I read or something. Oh. So mm, I it better be a good one. Yeah, no, just obviously because she's like she's very old. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so my point is simply, that just, I just thought of this the other day when I was sitting in church. It just kind of struck me, and I never thought never thought of it before, you know, because I don't really regularly go to places of worship. But I just think that's one avenue that maybe we could start eventually making a difference in, women, and then maybe that'll have an impact on the road. And I think in a lot of the religions... Like, for instance, the Catholic Church, they don't allow female priests. I think that's like a conversation that's becoming something that might happen at some point, but it's it's not there yet. And I, I don't know enough about the Hindu or the Islamic religion, but I'd, I'd imagine that's also uncommon there. And until that changes, this is this is going to continue in a lot of parts of the world where the, the leaders will be men, I'm sure, and most of the world, much of the world, but we, as you mentioned, some of the European countries, you start to see that changing. And at some point here, we'll, we'll find out if it's going to be this next time here in what, just a matter of, what, a year and a half. Are you allowed to comment on your political leanings or who you're looking at uh, in a good way? I am most intrigued by someone we mentioned earlier in the episode, uh, Pete Buttigieg. Is that how you pronounce yeah. his name? He has so much of a background, both military and just intelligent and knowing all these different languages. And the fact that he's young, it's just I I'm curious how he's going to go from someone no one knows until someone people know now and see what actually happens. Mm -hmm. And the caveat that he probably would be have a chance of being the front runner in some ways. But because he is a gay man, that there's some people that won't vote for him because of that. And that's going to be, this, some people might not vote for a woman. Some people might not vote for a gay man. Some people wouldn't have voted for a black man. There's going to be people that don't vote for these people that it's going to make them make it more difficult for them to win at in this point in history. I would like to live in a world where we just vote on the person because this person knows their shit. Right. And I want that person to be in charge. Right, because they're going to do a good job. He, maybe he's a guy I don't know enough yet for sure, but yeah. I'm most intrigued by where he's come from nowhere to be somewhere very fast. I like him. Thank you for your time today, Anu. Yes, thank you. This has been fun. Good to see you, Kurt. Good to see you, too. Bye. Thank you for listening to People I Know Show. Links are in the show notes for the People I Know Show Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. Please subscribe or follow those accounts when you visit them. A link is also in the show notes for the Free Thought Toastmasters Open House on May 20th, as I talked about earlier in the podcast. Would you or could you help me make this show grow? Leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. That's one of the best ways to do it. Otherwise, anytime you see a People I Know show social media post, like it, interact with it in some way. The more of that allows those posts to be visible to more people for more often. Please also encourage at least one other person in your life to listen or share your favorite episode on your social media page. To email your feedback directly to me, Kurt Karstensen, you can use the email address peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.